and let's put the PowerPoint in display mode. Perfect. Serge, how are you doing? Hello, everybody. Hi, Nick. Hello, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time, as usual. <laughs> Okay, great to see you. We're just waiting another minute. Okay. So that the let, me just check that, let me just check that what I'm going to share shares as well. It might be yeah. a good idea. Okay, we're going to, Stavrula is letting everybody in and okay. She, okay. she's controlling the screen right now. So she right. may not be able to unshare yet. Yeah, okay, so no problem. We could, we'll get it to work. We, yeah. We're just going to wait another minute because I see the number of participants increasing very quickly. And then we'll be ready to go. So are you at the office, Dick? <laughs> Jim knows my little secret. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, that's privileged information. You can't possibly know. That's but definitely a nice office background and view out your office window. But if I do, I don't know if you can hear that. Yeah, yeah, we can. Sound of the green screen in the background behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I find it's good for teaching because then otherwise, you know, otherwise I, uh, well, at least I can be anywhere. Let's put it that way. You can see my I'm sitting, background. I'm sitting at home in California. But... You can see my background, right? Yeah, I'm guessing that's real. <laughs> Sailing, oh, that's nice. Okay, 200, let's wait another minute uh, because uh, I know we have much more participants than this and we'll be ashamed that they, they missed the beginning. Oh, I'm M Nick McNeon. I like that. <laughs> I think I'm going to become neon. Welcome to the club. Uh, you know, for my name, I'm used that uh, it is me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Oh, sorry. Ah, I'm very sorry. I just hit the. Um, hang on. I think I may have just hit the. Uh, it didn't. Uh, did it stop the? Oh, no, it didn't. Okay. It told me it had stopped the screen sharing. Okay. okay, I suggest we start. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, dear participants. We are very pleased to see more than 450 of you, despite the quite short notice. And uh, it gives me really great pleasure to extend to you all a very warm welcome to the networking channel. Why the networking channel? In every crisis lies an opportunity. And because of the pandemic and the physical distances, we have all moved into a virtual world of interactions. We are certainly eager to meet again in person. I mean, we were just discussing about sharing a glass of wine or a glass of beer or a good dinner. However, we believe that some behaviors are here to stay. And we value the fact that online provides more inclusive participation. In particular, we should sustain the conditions for the community to meet and interact. And that's easy. The networking community channel will be organized as a regular event, taking place for one hour of live program every other Wednesday at the same time, where a diversity of events will be organized for the community. And what is really important is that the networking channel is promoting diversity. Topics are broad and open, ranging from research to experimentation and education. The channel will consist of webinars, panels, tutorials, virtual site visits, keynotes, and any other innovative form of community interaction. So we have organized a program committee to prepare the program, but we also welcome you to become an actor and an active contributor to the channel. The operation is quite simple. We have this regular live event every second Wednesday so that you can book them on your calendar. Today, you will be able to ask questions through the Q&I channel. 
The program will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel and presentations will be stored on our website. We also have a Slack channel hosted by ACM SICCOM that you can use as a permanent place to discuss. All these informations are available on networkingchannel.eu. I would like, of course, to thank the organizers. Special thank to Stavrula for their diligent work, as well as our sponsors, EU Empower Support Action, NSF Power Office, and ACM SICCOM. So we ambition to sustain the networking channel, reach steady state in the medium and long term. But we know in this case that the initial conditions are of utmost importance. And therefore, I am very, very pleased to hand over to Jim, sharing this exciting talk by Nick and the panel of graduate student discussions from all over the world. So let me now close by wishing you a delightful and stimulating time during the first edition and the next to come. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Thanks very much, Serge. Okay, thanks very much, Serge. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure to be able to welcome all of you to this first event in the, in the networking channel. And as Serge mentioned, um, we've got people participating from around the world in this. And this is really a wonderful thing, both as participants and folks out there. We've got uh, more than 400 people registered for this event. And we, we have speakers and participants who are coming from around the world. So in just a second, I'm going to introduce uh, the speaker for today's event. I'll tell you a little bit about the event itself. And then I want to, uh, before I introduce Nick McEwen, first, I introduce our graduate student panel uh, as well. So uh, for this particular event, each event is going to be a little bit different. This particular event, we've got about a 20-minute presentation by Nick McEwen on a topic of the network, which will be programmed by many and operated uh, by just a few. It's a really I know you're gonna find it an interesting talk. We're then gonna spend 10 to 20 minutes in conversations with graduate students from around the world. I'm gonna introduce you to them in a second. Then we're gonna have an opportunity for open questions from folks who are out there. We only have an hour. Uh, we are gonna be almost like a, a real channel and just operate for an hour uh, at a time every two weeks as Serge mentioned. But there's an opportunity for folks to um, uh, pose questions through the Q&A function that you see down on the bottom uh, right-hand side of your Zoom screen. And we probably won't be able to get to all of the questions, but we'll all see them, we'll moderate them, and we'll pose those questions uh, to Nick and, and, and potentially to the students as well. So I'm gonna introduce Nick in a second, but before I do that, I wanna introduce to you the graduate students who will be uh, posing some questions to Nick. So if we go to the next slide, Stavula. Oh. So, oh. hello everyone. Hi, Wei Han. I'm gonna introduce. I'm gonna introduce everybody. Oh, uh, um, okay, sorry. And but but there you see Wei Han Chen from Tsinghua <laughs> University. So we have five graduate students uh, coming from around the world to participate in this. And Wei Han Chen uh, is a graduate student at Tsinghua University uh, in China. Uh, we have Irene de Grieder Aguilas from. Uh, uh, Carlos Chacera in Madrid, she's in uh, Amsterdam. Right now we have Ananda Gort Strait from uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, in Brazil. I wanna also welcome Inam Alahi from the Information Technology University in Lahore, Pakistan, and uh, Rancia Ware from Carnegie Mellon University in the USA. So again, Nick's going to be uh, making a, a relatively short presentation. We'll have some discussion about that that will be initially led by the students and then we'll open it up for everybody. So Starula, if we could go back to the previous page, sorry. I wanna just say a couple of words uh, about Nick and I could go on for the entire hour introducing uh, Nick. He's done so many amazing things, but I'm gonna keep it short here. Nick's a professor in electrical engineering and computer science at Stanford University. Uh, he was an undergraduate student at the University of Leeds in the UK. Uh, he worked at HP Labs in the UK, then did a PhD in Berkeley, and then joined the faculty at Stanford University where he's been since then. Um, as many, probably most of you know, he's an amazing researcher. His research in 
uh, high-speed uh, switches and software-defined networking are really seminal contributions to our field. Um, if that's not enough, he's also a serial entrepreneur, uh, five companies by my count uh, with Martin Casado and Scott Schenker. He co-founded Nasira Networks in Palo Alto uh, to, uh, working on network virtualization that was acquired by VMware. His most recent company is Barefoot Networks, which was recently acquired by Intel. Um, and Nick's also a co-founder of the Open Networking Foundation, the ONF, to transfer control of open flow uh, many of you probably read the seminal OpenFlow paper to a newly created uh, not-for-profit organization. Among his many awards, uh, and I'm only going to mention a few, Nick received the ACM SIGCOM Lifetime Achievement Award, the IEEE Koji Kobayashi uh, Computers and Communications Award, the Lovelace Medal from the British Computer Society. He's an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the U.K. and a fellow of the IEEE uh, and the ACM. And if that weren't enough, uh, I just want to say he's also a really gifted teacher and a great mentor of graduate students. And, and even on top of that, again, just really a wonderful person. So it's really my pleasure uh, to be able to introduce uh, uh, our inaugural speaker for the networking channel, uh, Nick McEwen. So Nick, with that, it's all yours. Thank you, Jamie, making me blush. <laughs> 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 Hey, I just uh, I just think that this whole thing is a really really good idea. This networking channel. So thank you to 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 you to Serge to all the the folks that were were, were involved in organizing it because uh, it's just kind of got boring, isn't it? Sitting at home and being able to engage with people who we wouldn't normally meet, right? Because we tend to engage when we're, we're when we're engaging online with people we already know. Um, but when you go to a conference or a workshop, you get to meet new people that you bump into in the corridor or at the coffee shop or wherever. And so it, this is a fantastic, this is a fantastic idea. And the thing that's great about it actually is that hopefully it brings together people who, who may not normally go to the same conferences, right? And they're in different parts of the world. And so if we can get to know a, a broader group of people this way, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Um, so with, without further ado, let me, can, can you see my screen? Can someone just what can you see? Yes, we can. Yep. yep. Excellent. And you can just, you, <laughs> I always worry at this point that what you see is my speaker notes that you don't see actually. But you can see the regular, the- uh, Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, the good. <laughs> so what I wanted just to, to, to say is that uh, I think it's a really exciting time in networking. Um, uh, it probably gets a bit uh, fatiguing to hear people saying that, but uh, I actually think there's something really fundamental that's changing in networking that hasn't changed since, uh, certainly in the time that I've been a, a, a faculty member and a professor. Um, it, it, it reminds me a little bit more of the time when I was first starting, starting out working in networking in the, uh, in the 1980s, when the, before the World Wide Web, and uh, no one actually knew what the internet was. So there was a big change clearly that happened then. But there seems to be a massive change that's taking place now. Um, we can argue about whether it's good or bad for the industry of networking or the internet as a whole. I personally think that it's a good thing, but it's a particularly good thing for us as a research community because it's enabling us to do things that we could never have done before. And I think this is super exciting. And it's uh, what, 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 what gets me excited every day is the sorts of things that we together can do. And most importantly, when you're creating something which is programmable that other people can do, because it's programming is all about enabling other people to do exciting stuff. So I wanna talk a little bit about those changes. Some of you have, have heard me give a talk like this before, and I apologize if this is a repeat, but I really wanted to, uh, uh, to, to, to say this to a larger audience today and then tee it up for discussion and, and, and debate. It's very similar to what uh, a group of us have been working on in what's called the Pronto program. And the Pronto program is a DARPA funded program. Um, and uh, I'm a PI, so is Jen Rexford um, at Princeton, uh, Nate Foster at Cornell, and then a team at the Open Networking Foundation. So Larry Peterson, Guru Farulka, Oswane, and uh, we've been working on this project for, for a while, but it's really a culmination of sort of a coming together of many things that you'll, that you'll be f familiar with. So I wanna talk about the things that have been changing and therefore what that means I think is gonna happen next. And I think the biggest change is a change of who is control. So who is, con in, who is in, 
in, in charge of the control plane software that decides how networks operate. So in the past, um, in, in the distant past, networks were built from sort of closed and proprietary uh, devices. We've all seen these pictures before of sort of mainframe, mainframe uh, routers. And certain parts of the internet are still built this way. And they were kind of badly engineered. They were uh, based on hundreds of millions of lines of source code. They supported hundreds or thousands of, of protocols. There are something like 10,000 internet RFCs at this point. And, and the internet really paid the price for this immense complexity. So the routers themselves were very bloated. They were very poorly engineered in, in, internal, internally. And there wasn't really any incentive to improve them. It was just sort of piling on complexity over complexity. And so as a consequence, it made it a very, uh, it sort of created this, this, um, uh, this barrier to entry for anyone else to enter into the internet, uh, internet router business. And they had very little, you know, when you have this sort of mon monopolistic behavior, uh, there's very little incentive to, to keep improving anything. And so the internet kind of got stuck. So this is the kind of the 2000s, the mid-2000s. Mid, mid and there were lots of us that were very disenchanted and this term internet ossification came about. And you, uh, you, if you go back, you'll see many references to this from, from, from that time. And essentially networks were hard to manage they were unreliable, they were very hard to secure, and they were hard to scale. And it was this hard to scale that really proved to be the, the, the demise of this, this model. Because we know today that the big cloud providers and more than half the switches in the world today are actually inside data centers. So the big cloud providers decided to hell with that model. I don't like this closed and proprietary and all the problems that it brings. I'm just gonna build it for myself. And we know this story, they homegrown, they home built this from software that they wrote themselves. They had access to merchant silicon that they could build these from and they wrapped sheet metal around it and added the software on top. And then they built their networks at the kind of scale that they needed. They had the benefit of Linux by this point. It was super stable. They could rely on it as the sort of the operating system or the, the platform upon which they were building it. And increasingly, they're using a lot of open source. And this actually is, is, is part of the entry point for us as a, as a research community. But by doing it this way, simple, lean, mean, based on boxes of, of their own construction, of their own design of software that they run themselves. It meant that the networks were easier to fix. They could add new stuff that they needed to decide where the traffic went. They could fast more, more quickly recover from, from errors. They could catch intrusions more easily. Why is it that they could do all of these things? Because they control the software. They are the ones who know how to build these things at scale. We don't, I certainly don't, but they with that, uh, with that visibility into what they needed to do in their networks, they could fix these for themselves by innovating very, very quickly. And so in the past, big software releases for internet routers would be like once per year or once every two years. Uh, suddenly it was like once per month. And so they could sort of move at the speed of software, software that they developed themselves. And a second change that's been sort of going on uh, past that and one that I've been more, more intimately involved with is the, 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 the their desire to take control of how packets are processed too. This is definitely not, not a story that is complete and there's definitely open to debate as to how this will happen. But essentially, if you want to be in control of how a network behaves and what it does, you sort of need to be in control of how the packets are processed. That's all the network does is it takes packets from one place and delivers, delivers them to somewhere else. And so unless you're in charge of, the, of how the packets are processed, you're not really in charge of what they do. So slowly, slowly, those who own and operate big networks, cloud providers in particular, uh, giving, getting more control by replacing what were fixed function switches and, and NICs in the past with devices that are programmable. This shows a particular one, with, which is a P4 programmable. It doesn't need to be P4, but something which is more programmable and adaptable. It started out with things that were more like FPGAs. It's now become sort of particular domain specific processes this is just we're just observing one part in a change that is happening and the reason that people are doing this is because you now can you can do it at the similar power performance and cost that you could for the fixed function in the past so why not it gives you the the, the ability to to change it the third change which i want to talk about is open source so open source was there at the beginning of the network, you probably remember the phrase rough consensus and running code. It was sort of the mantra of the IETF. And the running code was open source code that people would then use. And then what happened was that networking went into this, this, this period 
of incredible growth that was all about standards and protocols and interoperability. It was a really important for its growth that the boxes themselves, the routers, they, they exposed standardized protocols on the outside, but then they were secret and proprietary on the inside. They kept it under wraps as to how they actually, how they perform these, these, these functions. No problem with that. That was a sort of a way for them to, to move quickly and differentiate from, from each other and create a big business. But it, in networking, um, it, it, it so, so happened that by the mid 2000s, open source was almost a dirty word. Everything had been done closed and proprietary internally and network management was considered a bit of a joke. Everybody home, did their own homegrown solutions based on scripts and things like this. And uh, the, the term open source was not really taken that. How could you build a piece of national infrastructure of national importance upon which we all depend on open source code? Isn't that just for, 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 for amateurs and hobbyists? But then as we know, something happened and it was Linux. And then uh, other big projects like Mozilla and Apache and all of these big open source projects that showed that not only could you, but increasingly huge part portions of the, of the internet applications were being built out of open source code. And so it re-emerged as something that was trustworthy, as a trustworthy way to control networks. Here is just a few examples. You've probably heard of some of them. It doesn't particularly matter. I used to keep a list of all of these open source projects in, in networking. Now I can't even keep track. There are hundreds and hundreds of them and they're actually at an accelerating pace. So this is something that's really changing. So network code that was opaque in the past has become more transparent and open. And why is this good? Because the network infrastructure is important for everybody. It's a kind of a international, global, essential piece of how we, how we live these days. So that having it as something that is a shared resource that we can all develop is goodness for society. Okay, that's not how business gets created, but it's good for business because it's necessary, but non-differentiating. It's necessary to have a network. It's not particularly differentiating to have the base platform and the base operations. So everybody can collaborate. It allows big cloud providers to co collaborate with each other around open source, as well as ISPs and mobile operators and hobbyists and researchers all to pile onto the same code. And we're beginning to see that happen already. Okay, so everything I've said so far, you've probably heard some variant of before, possibly from me or from someone else. Uh, these are things that we have, we have. And I think the important question is what happens next? And so I think, think this is where the opportunity really begins for us as researchers. And the way that we've been sort of expressing that within this Pronto program, but I think this is, this is broadly true out, uh, outside as well, is that networks for the first time are becoming not just programmable and, and open source, they're becoming programmable end to end. Everything in this pipe that I show here, right? So this network structure that I'm showing, uh, that I'm showing here shows a bunch of switches, a bunch of, of, of uh, network interfaces at the edges that might be running a virtual switch to interconnect virtual machines running on the end hosts, some user space code, a kernel stack network operating system that is running at the, at the end hosts, and then controlled either locally or in this particular case, a sort of an SDN control plane that is, that is remote. So it's sort of broadly representative of the way that big data center or cloud networks are, and increasingly how big telco uh, networks are being built. But I believe that for the first time, these networks are gonna be programmable end-to-end. -end. Everything in that blue pipeline at the bottom is becoming programmable. The switches, the NICs, clearly the, end, the user space code is already using acceleration code like DPDK in the kernel with EPPF. And the, it's also gonna be increasingly specified top-down. We hear people talk about intent, I think intent is is, uh, is is a broad term as for a specification of the desired behavior at the top. And you'd like that to be compiled all the way down to how the packets are processed at the, the bottom and defined entirely by software. Nothing fixed function. The only fixed function in the hardware is the instruction set of the CPUs that are running the control plane and the instruction set of the switches and next in the, in the forwarding plane. And I think this creates some really exciting new possibilities. It, not, it, apart from
from the obvious, we can add stuff to it, we can do more stuff because it's programmable, it's malleable, it's flexible, but it allows us to bring in lots of things from the software engineering industry, like verifying across all of the layers of abstraction, top to bottom, that things are correct by construction. When you compile, did it still preserve the properties that you'd wanted in the original specification and the original intent? chip design industry the software industry does this that does this all the time in networking not so much but now if it's everything is programmable from the top to the bottom rather than the bottom up from protocols and standards it means that we can bring to bear a lot of these tools that have been around for a while and if we know what we originally intended it means that we can measure and validate and check that it's actually doing what we originally intended and then potentially we can through closed loop control actually start to fix it and I think this is the essence of automating the, the network is you've got to start from something which is completely programmable and then with a well-known specification that you can check and observe in order to be able to then fix it when it breaks. Another exciting part of this is 5G is being defined in software too, all the way down to the radios. The uh, seeing a description of, of some of the L1 physical layer processing being done in CPUs. I mean, who knew that you could do that, right? So everything being defined in software all the way out to the radio, all the way up into how it's controlled and managed, adopting a model that's very similar to this one. So suddenly, Instead of 5G in that cellular world being this closed wall off limits to us as a sitcom community, often buried in some standards body, suddenly it is opening up as well. Lots of open source, lots of software, lots of programmability. And so we can think of it now as just part of the internet. In fact, it could be the majority of the internet within a few years, the way that, uh, the way that it seems to be heading. So I think that in future, this is means, and I'm going to try now and get into the you know, I'll, I'll put some stakes in the ground and this is something we can discuss and, 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 and debate. So I think that we'll think of the network as a programmable platform. What does that mean? Don't we already think of it as a programmable platform? If you've downloaded ONOS or something like this, then yeah, sure, you can think of it as a programmable platform. I mean more than that, that everything is open to being programmed all the way down to the way the packets are processed as a single platform. We're nowhere near there yet, because we think of it as lots of in individual pieces that would have to go and change. But I think that we will move towards thinking of it as an entire platform where the behavior is described at the top by whoever owns and operates the network. It'll then be partitioned down into the different units, hopefully automatically compiled and then run across those different elements. And uh, that, that over time, that entire stack will become, so in, that, that, that control plane stack will emerge as a way that we define the, define the behavior. I think that the networks will be deeply programmable, in other words, from the top to the bottom by those who own and operate them. Initially, the cloud service providers, perhaps the ISPs and the mobile operators, eventually into enterprises to the extent that uh, they will continue to manage and, and, and operate their networks on college campuses, in our homes. I think those who want to, now we could either download that software, you can do this for many network operations today and so you don't have to modify anything, but I think we'll be in a position to modify and improve it if we see, if we see fit. And I think that this deep programmability, this, this ability to change anything, means we can decide what we observe. Because everything is open, everything is programmable, it means we can decide what knobs we can turn. This is a, a phrase that I, that I like that Jen Rexford uses. We decide what knobs we can turn in order to control and change things, and what dials we have in order to be able to see what the network is doing in a way that we haven't seen before. So if we want to see every packet and see exactly what time it showed up at every networking device, then we can do that if we want. And in fact, this has been one of the first uses of network programmability in commercial networks, is people using it to observe how a packet moves through the network and what it does at every hop as it, as it goes. Something that someone chose to do just because the network was programmable. As a consequence, I think that it will mean that the, the, the way that we, uh, the, that we think of the network will no longer be in terms of protocols. So this is slightly more uh, uh, controversial now. I don't think that we will be thinking of the networks as primarily protocols up. In other words, we've got to start with interoperability of things that are protocol. I don't think we'll spend so much time designing protocols. Clearly, we need to think about how things communicate with each other. It's a network after all. But I think that we will, that we will think of protocol behavior as being derived from the software that we, that we write. We'll think of an algorithm that we want to implement. We implement it in the software. And the interoperability will come as a consequence of 
that software that gets compiled, partitioned down on all of the different network elements. And it's gonna change the way that we teach networking. Uh, this is something that keeps me up at night is thinking about what does this mean for the way that we teach networking? Does it matter so much that we teach in terms of you know, the, the layering, the seven layer or the four layer model? Um, doesn't it mean that we should be arming our, our students to be thinking how to program a big distributed system and all of the distributed system skills that they will that they will need to bring to bear? I don't know. I don't know how we'll do it. We spend a lot of time talking about it, but uh, we haven't quite figured out exactly how that's going to work just yet. And I think that it will mean that if you can change the way that the network behaves and you can observe what it's doing at very, very fine grain, and you can go back and change it, the networks will become under this closed loop control. How will that closed loop control works? I don't know. Many of you will have some good ideas and I hope you bring those ideas to experimental platforms, to papers that you write and new, new ideas and new theories and new ways of doing it. Because I think it's a really exciting open, uh, sort of open question. We have a particular way that we're trying to do this within our program. Don't claim that this is the, the, the best or the only way to do it, but it's basically to have as much visibility as you can into what the packets are doing, feed that into checking to see whether that's what you wanted them to do. And then if it's not what you wanna do, go back and fix whether it's the code, whether it's the state in the switches or the routers, or whether it's to identify a broken element within the network, but to try and bring that automation. Because at the end of the day, people want to build networks that are huge and, and on huge scale, very, very fast, and not have to be sitting there watching everything that's going on all the time, because it's just impractical for a human to keep up with uh, with networks at that scale, just impractical for them to do so. So anyone that wants to operate a big network is looking for a way to automate it so that they can program it. So ultimately they would have a network that they can program to do what they want to do. So it will be a network that's programmed by many, them and others sharing the development of this code and hopefully operated by few so that it can run efficiently and quick and adapt to any problems. I'm gonna stop there. Um, and uh, happy to take any questions about this or any other topic that seems uh, that seems to be on your mind. So we'll take it from there. So Nick, thanks so much. That was that was totally awesome, especially the part at the end, glimpsing uh, into the future. You know, I think of you as equally an electrical engineer and a computer scientist, and now I'm thinking of you more as a computer scientist. I, I have to say, <laughs> with your take on where the world is going. So what we're going to do next is. We have our, our, our five student uh, discussants and they've got a couple of questions that they want to ask you. So I'm going to turn things over to them very quickly. And then after that, we've got some time to take questions that are coming in from the 250, 300 people who are out there who can enter questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. And we're going to moderate those. And I'm going to read those to you. The students are going to pose the question, their own questions to you. But after the students have, have their turn, we'll pull some questions out of the Q&A. And if we don't get a chance to ask all of the Q&A, um, there's an opportunity to, um, I'll, I'll make sure you get all of the questions. I want Great. to remind people that there is a Slack channel where we can continue conversations as well. Okay, so with that, let me, let me share my screen. And again, I'm gonna turn things over uh, to, to our grad students. And again, I wanna thank them for participating um, in this. And we're just gonna go through this alphabetically. Uh, maybe we could have followed the sun around the earth, but uh, we're gonna start <laughs> off with a question from Weihan Chen, who's at Tsinghua University. Weihan? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, yes. Uh, hi, Nick. Thanks hello. for sharing, uh, uh, hello. Uh, thanks for sharing about the programmable network. I agree that a deep programmable network can make us more convenient to manage it. However, the network management may be a trivial work attempt. We usually need to adjust the controlling policy according to the variation of the network. So in recent years, some research like Knowledge Defender Network proposed to use machine learning technologies like deep learning or reinforcement learning to achieve automatic policy generation. Actually, these machine learning technologies may have problems like learning efficiency or interpretation such as we may do not know why the learning result is good or even worse, why the result is bad. So in your opinion, whether machine learning, whether machine learning technologies can be combined with the control plan 
and undertakes the obligation to make a controlling policy. Moreover, do you think machine learning technologies can be applied to data plan and relate some work like adaptive traffic forwarding? Thanks. That's a great question. I, I think it's a very big, it's a really big question. Um, and I should start by saying that uh, I'm not entirely convinced that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in, you know, a, a very credible responder to the to the question because I don't work in machine learning, um, but that's a bit of a cop out. We all know what it's trying to do, what machine learning is is attempting to do. It's really, really good at helping us uh, understand the behavior, or rather, uh, predict the behavior of a system that we don't really understand, right? Or one that is very, very hard for us to model, right? Speech, vision. Yeah. You know, our brains know what to do, but it's been proved very hard for us to describe that in software in a way that, that, that really, really works well. Um, and uh, so, you know, where you've got either a, an unknown model or an unknown set of inputs, like with autonomous vehicles, where you need to train them like crazy on all the unexpected things of where the stop sign happens to be, where someone's going to cross the road, and, and different shapes of, of, of uh, uh, speed limit signs and things like this. So we need to train them with those things. I would put it to you, and I'm happy to be proved wrong on this, that networking is not like that, that networking is is largely about implementing something that we want to according to a model that we already know. We have an idea of what we're trying to do and that the number of sort of stimuli the, the, uh, and inputs to the system is relatively small. Things can go wrong, things can break, memories can fail, links can go down, but it's not like the, the sorts of things you have to deal with in speech processing and speech recognition, for example. So if we already know the model, what role does the machine learning offer us in terms of identifying when things are not what uh, we are expecting, right? So we already knew. And, and so the approach that we've been taking is trying and say, we've got this model, can we actually check against that model in a more formal way? We could be wrong. It could prove too yeah. difficult, right? And it may yeah. be that you need so much mathematical uh, sort of, you know, model checking or whatever. You need, you know, so much machinery to do that that it's just impractical. And as has turned out, sometimes a machine learning, a simple machine learning model, might actually get there quicker. And uh, wouldn't that be wonderful? But I think that to start with, we're going to see, we're going to give it a go and see whether we can do it this way. But um, I would encourage you, if you, if you think otherwise, to to go show us, right? To go to go show the world that that, that would be the that would be the case because uh, there's um, you know I think the jury is definitely out on this one. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Boris. Great, great discussion. Mm -hmm. So our next question is going to come from uh, Irene de Gruder Aguilez from uh, uh, University of Carlos Tercera, third in uh, in Spain. So Irene. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Great talk. Um, yeah, thank you for this energy put into these kind of panels. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is, uh, regarding the uni courses that you teach uh, towards first and second year bachelor students, usually a base uh, networking, uh, a base in networking needs to be explained to understand further concepts. So how do you explain the ongoing change in network ar architecture, for instance, like from moving from distributed protocols to like more decentralized architectures like SDN, so that the student understand what existed before compared to what there is now. Yeah, that's another really good question. Uh, so this is this is something else. This this is definitely something that keeps me awake at night, right? And uh, probably Jim too, as the writer of textbooks, right? Um, I think a lot of people are wondering um, as our field gets bigger. And this is true of all areas of computer science, electrical engineering, that over time our field gets bigger. We know more, there's more history, there's more learning that's taken place. What do you decide in a, you know, a 10, 12, 16 week quarter term or semester, what you're actually going to be able to cover? What are the important things to cover? And how do you balance the, the things that got in the past that were important that happened at the early stages, you know, how the internet came about, right? I just feel it's really important for an undergraduate to know uh, what the world was like before we had an internet 
because you know they don't remember, right? They weren't, weren't alive at that time. And then what what are the surprising things about the way the internet is built? We take it for granted that it's you know reliable byte stream over an unreliable in, in infrastructure. Um, that was a shocking, controversial suggestion at the time, and many people debated, argued. I think it's kind of good to know why that was and how different that was from the way that things have done in the past. But if you keep going on all these things that seem important, you could you have a two-year course, right? And then before you know it, there's uh, there's no one interested in anymore <laughs> in, in sitting it out. So these things that are that are new, you, you basically got to figure out what it is that you that, that you cut. I mean, it's a, it's <laughs> it's a fixed amount of time. So. Um, I think that actually in our in our particular internet networking class at Stanford, we were probably late to the game in introducing some of these architectural changes, things like SDN, what is really behind it? And um, you know, I prefer to, te to, to teach it about a change of control, really. It's a more of a business change than a technical change. That's how I happen to see it, that it was really a tussle for who was in, in control of the software that controlled the network. Um, but uh, there, there are so many changes like that that are happening that are happening now. So it does mean that we've de-emphasized some of the things that were happening at the physical layer, medium access control protocols. Uh, you know, what was CSMA CD? How did it really work? What was the history behind that? Um, do I feel comfortable removing those things? Not entirely, because I think that they have a lot of learning in them too. But you've just got to make that trade-off in the end, because at the end of the day, we're trying to prepare people for either a, a career as a networking engineer or as a networking researcher or just someone who is knowledgeable about networking. And those things matter less than they used to. It pains me to say that, but they matter less than they used to. And so I think that we have to figure out how we adapt. And you know, the thing I was saying just a few minutes ago, that, that it's all becoming about software. I think that has fundamental consequences for how we teach because it's very important to get a hands-on, at least it's easier to have a hands-on software experience um, in, 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 in large classes anywhere, right? But uh, figuring out how to do that in a way that exposes students, not just to the intricacies of writing protocol code, that can be kind of boring, but the, you know, how you write, a, how you create a big distributed system, what are the problems that you have to solve in order to do that? So um, uh, yes. To, to be continued, but uh, not an easy, not an easy question. Yeah, it's a really great question, Irene. And, and also, I just point out there was a uh, a SICOM education workshop last August that Nick and uh, um, we had several hundred people from around the world again globally participating in that. And there are white papers. I think if you were to search for the SICOM education workshop August 2020, you find the white papers there. There's a lot of interesting discussions along these lines. Okay. Uh, so why don't we move on? And uh, Ananda Gork Strait from the University, uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, is our uh, next student discussing. So, uh, Ananda? Hi, Jim. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, panel. Um, hi, Nick. Uh, it was Hello. a really nice talk. Uh, well, my first question is about uh, what do you think about SDN for home networks? And the follow-up is, how do you think SDN in home networks can leverage measurements and as a consequence uh, offer better control over flows and buffers for higher QoS in services uh, like Netflix, for example? Uh -huh. that, that, nice question. Um, you know, I did this question of where does, where, who is SDN useful or who is this sort of taking over the control of the, of the software actually useful, useful to? You know, there are some networks for which it's kind of obvious, right? Cloud service providers, clearly they need to do this to be able to build at scale. Um, I personally think that anyone that operates a very large network, most home networks are very small, right? They consist of an access point or a couple of access points, maybe a switch. Um, and, uh, but the, fir the, the, the first, uh, open flow based network that we, we used was actually in my house. So I had an open flow switch and we had a control plane, that, a controller that was running in AWS 
And every time there was a communication going on between, I don't know, a laptop in, in, in the house and something else, then it would be intermediated by that control plane that would do, it was even doing DHCP and DNS and all of this. And the interesting thing was it worked better and it worked faster. And I think the primary reason for that was that DNS worked better that way than it did going through AT&T's DNS service. But I think that was probably the main reason why it worked faster. Um, but uh, you know, what was, we were kind of interested in what was the benefit. And it was at about the time that two home networking companies were, were starting up. One was called Meraki, cloud, uh, cloud managed um, uh, Wi-Fi that started from a project at MIT and uh, then turned into a, a, a company that is now um, part of Cisco in which it's cloud managed through a remote control plane that is controlling a very simple and dumbed down, down uh, access point or switch um, that can operate in a small business. And some people uh, I've, I've seen put in, in homes um, you know, it's usually a bit of overkill um, for, a, for, a, for a home, but for a small business or for a school, that kind of makes sense. And there's another company called Ubiquity that you may have heard of, and uh, they do the same thing. It's sort of uh, cloud managed or locally managed sort of SDN controller that's controlling the switches and the access points. And uh, actually, the network I have in my house is ubiquity based. Um, that wasn't meant to be a commercial for them, but just sort of an, uh, that I, I like it because it just happens to give me a lot of visibility into everything that's going on. You know, I'm a network geek, so it's nice to be able to do that. But it's allowed um, uh, them to do the kinds of things that you're asking about. It, 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 they can talk about flows and they can talk about flows between different points easily because they have, you know, that control plane builds a, a good global consistent view of what the network is and um okay in a home network that's quite small but in a you know in a business network that might be quite big and so they get that view and then they can act upon that consistent global view it's just an easier way you think of the network as a graph so act upon the graph so build the graph and then act upon it that's kind of what what the, that approach is so actually i think that it makes a lot of sense if you think about it most um nowadays most telco networks that are managing the access point in people's homes in the United States, that could be a company like Comcast or AT and T, but you know this is happening worldwide through um, through remote control. They're they're cloud managing the 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 device that's in your home, and uh, they found that that's an easy way to do it. Whether it's through the DOCSIS standard or whatever that happens to be, so I think that we're moving in that direction, and they are moving in the direction of writing that software for themselves and owning that software. Okay. Great questions uh, and, and, and great answer. There's actually a number of related questions in the q and we're, we're gonna get to at least one or two questions from the Q&A. Uh, so the, the next student uh, discussant is uh, Inam Alahi from the Information Technology University in Lahore, Pakistan. So uh, Inam. Hi, <clears throat> I wanted to ask that uh, there have been similar trends in the past, uh, like uh, shifting from decentralized to uh, from centralized to a decentralized system, which have not been yet realized. What do you think? Why do you think that this moving towards SDNs is the best abstraction, and uh, we will not be retracting from it in the future? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think the pendulum often sw swings in different directions, without doubt. Um, you know, the early internet, it made mo it, we probably wouldn't have the internet, or we wouldn't even use the word internet if it hadn't been decentralized. And that was because it allowed extremely rapid organic growth, because no one was in charge. Uh, it was just you just needed to persuade it, find someone that you could persuade to attach your BGP router to and exchange prefixes with that's all you need, <laughs> you need to do in order to add to the internet. And so it like grew like wildfire. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, it turned out that in order to run very big networks, it's much easier if you can think of it as a whole rather than as a collection of individual boxes, right? So there are some of the cloud providers have a rule. You're not allowed to log into an individual switch because if you do, you can't possibly scale, right? You've got to actually think of them as peripherals to a, a, central, a central view. I happen to think that makes sense at scale uh, just because it's much easier way to think of managing something that's very that's very big, um, there is an uh, there's an alternative view that says that the network itself should be just dumb simple plumbing that's just forwarding packets, probably just IPv4, IPv6, and it shouldn't be doing anything else. That's all it should be doing. 
Uh, as networking people, we're shocked by this idea because it makes us all irrelevant, right? It makes us all redundant. But uh, the you know there's a, there's another view that says keep it really really simple and then move all of the you know everything else at the edge. And if everything else is about applications and security and the way that the applications are talking to each other, you know then then it's actually distributed. So uh, you know there is an alternative view, and we might the pendulum might swing back that way. Um, I, I think that's a fair that's a fair guess. Right. Thank you. And, and I guess no matter what, you're talking about raising the level of abstraction up to a system level, not programming individual devices or not configuring individual devices. So that's a, a different worldview for network operators and people who want to work in network management, for example. Yes. Right. right. Okay. Uh, the last question comes from Wei Ware. Uh, she's a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University in, in the U.S. And, and I will simply add that I'll take... Uh, uh, credit for teaching her her first networking course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? right. Um, so it was actually my second networking oh, class. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I took the undergrad networking class while I was a master's student at Amherst. <laughs> and then I took your class and I was like, I'm gonna go do networking research. So cool. <laughs> now I'm here. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of technical questions. So I wanted to ask something else. Um, you know, we're all grad students, so I'm wondering um, if you could sort of go back in time, would you have done anything differently as a grad student? Would I have done anything differently as a grad student? That's a great question. So the only thing that, 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 that there are quite a few, there are quite a few things that are done differently. Um, I think I would have been a graduate student for longer. Uh, I would have delayed graduating. Um, and uh, I think like many graduate students, I felt as though I was in a hurry to get out the door. And then after it was like, why was I in such a hurry? This was the best years. They're the most, and, and, and I'm sorry, people keep saying that to you. I know, I understand that, but believe me, it's true. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's all downhill from, it's all downhill <laughs> after graduate school. So don't be in a hurry to finish, right? Uh, that would be the first thing I would have spent longer. The second thing is I would have taken more math classes. I actually did take quite a few math classes. I found myself in an electrical engineering group that was doing stochastic control, um, and most of which I didn't understand. And so I was taking math classes to try and understand what my PhD advisor was, was doing. But the, uh, and so I benefited greatly from it, um, but I wish I'd taken more because you can learn most things about systems from reading papers, from just keeping up with, uh, you know, just talking to people because, you know, let's face it, most of most of the things we've just been talking about are kind of descriptive. They're conceptual, but they're descriptive. They're not deeply mathematical. But where we can bring mathematics to the understanding of systems, whether it's in the way we build a model of desired network behavior, or whether it's in QoS or packet dynamics, and think, you know, these things really matter. And so we need to have good mathematical tools available to us. They're very hard to learn on your own. Right, we know that, right? It's 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 a big struggle to learn that from an online course. So have it being in a group of peers for where you get that peer pressure, I've got to do the problem set by next week. So I always encourage my students to continue to take math classes. I prefer it if they're taking at least one per quarter. I know they don't really in practice, but that would be the kind of the desired state. Um, another thing was that, um, uh, that, that I did by accident. I didn't realize I was doing it, but I would have done it more deliberately. I used to say to my professor and anyone that would listen when I was a grad student, that the only thing I knew absolutely for sure was I didn't want to be a professor. <laughs> and all the way through it, there was no way in heck that I was going to ever apply for a faculty job. And then it was right at the last minute at the end, it was like, okay, actually, I really enjoy what I'm doing. And wouldn't it be interesting to find out how that works at other universities? And it was at that point. So what I would have done differently is I would have kept my options open. I would have explored multiple paths. I think keeping your options open was so encouraged to focus and stay narrow, but look how the field of networking is changing. Look how the field of systems is changing. Look how machine learning in a way just came rapidly out of nowhere into this massive field. If you've got a strong statistics and mathematics uh, foundation, you can understand that as soon as it arises and then be ready for it. So I think that keeping your options open is, um, and, I, and, and I, you know, I think that I would have benefited from considering more career options or thinking about it at that time, because I would have uh, been more prepared and more ready for what happened next. Okay, great. So, so thank you again, all for those, for those great questions. And um, let's thank see, you. we've got probably, 
30 questions that have come in, Nick, and uh, we don't have that much more time left. Uh, okay. what, what we'd like to do is I'd like to post just two questions that have come in, but I'd like to say to everybody, we will make sure all these questions get posted on the Slack channel, and that's right. always a great forum uh, for discussion and something that will persist. So uh, uh, let me ask you one, one, one's more technical and one there's, another's a little bit maybe more policy oriented. And, and the technical one will take you up the protocol step, or sorry, there are no protocols anymore, I forgot. <laughs> uh, take me up the software stack or take you up the software stack even further. And um, so the question is for the internet that we have today, applications uh, can't state their intent and the network can't express what the offerings are. And so do you have any comments about how this application level network, meaning, you know, not the network layer, but the, the, the entire, uh, all the way up, uh, might change in the future? Um, yeah. I Yes, I mean, to a couple of a couple of thoughts. One is that um, the you know it, if you subscribe to the sort of the theory or the idea that ultimately the network will be just blazing fast, reliable plumbing that just connects together endpoints, then all of that ha can happen in the way that the sort of the communication is happening between the applications and the sort of the the whoever is controlling and managing the network. And for that, the communication of the desire of the application to that control plane can take, can take place, right? I don't particularly subscribe to that because I think that the network has more to, to, to offer and, 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 and uh, needs to do more than just simply be that plumbing. It needs to take responsibility for some of the uh, congestion avoidance, congestion control, the the sort of the delivery time, the delivery rate. Um, it needs to expose the ability for the control plane to do that. And so that communication becomes about the things that the applications care about. How quickly can I communicate? How reliably can I communicate? And um, whether what the sort of the trust domain is, what is the, the, the set of the set of entities that can talk to me and whom I can talk to. They're, they're all things for which in the general internet, it's very difficult to express today, but inside, uh, you know, data centers and particularly with overlay network virtualization, these things are becoming quite routine. That a, work, a set of workloads, a set of, you know, a client workload within a typically a private data center is able to communicate with a control plane and say, this is the behavior that, that I want. And then it becomes a negotiation between them. It's not RSVP, it's not anything that we would recognize. It's merely a figuring out of other resources available and can you provide that level of security and reliability and quality of service that I'm asking for. So it's sort of happening, it's a bit ad hoc. I wouldn't say that it's particularly elegant, not in the ones that I've, that I've seen. It's not designed for sort of general apl applicability, but I think that, that that will happen more over time um, as a consequence of the workloads that then spread across, you know, multiple, whether it's ed at the edge and whether it's in multiple clouds. And so I think that that will inevitably come. Okay, great. Uh, so last question, and then we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up uh, just because a lot of people are going to have to run. Several people are going off to teach networking classes or take sure. networking classes, yeah. <laughs> uh, given the comments. So the last one has to do, and actually there are several questions along the lines of the democratization of the internet and maybe what you mean by operated by a few. So do you see, um, you know, for instance, do you see rise of a small number of large corporate, oh. large entities that are operating globally and that's sort of it? Uh, or do you see sort of a, a sort of a broader set of operators? Uh, what does this mean in terms of uh, you know who controls the network, and that may mean more in an operational sense than a programmability sense. Thanks for asking that question because I realized that when I said operated by few, I actually meant something slightly different, which right, is I, you know oh, the definitely. big operator needs fewer people in order to manage the network. But what you're saying, I think, is also true, and I think it's 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 interesting. It will represent a change, and I think for many people this is quite worrying. So if you think if if you've read about um, the way that uh, big cloud providers are beginning to uh, provide the 
both the servers and the networking equipment that goes towards the edge into enterprises, into college campuses elsewhere, you could look at this as, wow, this is great. The, the cloud is, which is wonderful and cheap and so flexible and I use it for all my work and I can now push it out towards the, to, to the edge and I'll get the same look and feel. And if the application needs to be, well, it's all great, right? But then you think about it and say, okay, what happened to the public internet? Uh, now all of my communication is taking place through the cloud providers. So instead of the cloud providers running on the public internet, the public internet becomes a service that they operate. Uh, and we will get connected together from the edge through their devices, through the cloud. You can think of this as a great thing because sure as heck, they know how to build good systems that work and uh, they're, all, they're all super agile, they're all defined in software and so they can move and improve it over time. The cost structure is fantastic because they do it at such enormous scale. So these seem like good things. The concentration to a relatively small number of operators, I think has reason to, to cause concern, particularly if you're neither in the West Coast of the United States where the US, you know, the US cloud operators tend to be or in China, so the two you know the two countries for whom uh, are producing was I think it is slightly concerning for for everyone else. So I think that the democratization of that 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 control and ownership is of on many many people's minds. Um, but I, I think that the best way that we as researchers can play a part in this is by ensuring that the software that we write, that the ideas that we promote, are as openly usable and available to anybody, so that if anybody wants to start up and then uh, compete with, uh, with, uh, with, with these providers or run services on top that improve upon it and therefore make it more available to others, that's goodness. Um, but um, you know, I think there's a legitimate cause for concern. Okay, uh, great. So um, I, I hope you, you will get a chance next to take a look at the Q and A's because everybody starts off by saying, Fabulous talk, and and I just want to echo that on behalf of everybody. Just a, a fabulous talk, and and I want to thank the students again, all of you again. Thank for, you for the great uh, questions. You know, yeah, for the great and thoughtful questions. Um, we are gonna we're gonna be wrapping up here. We're gonna move the questions that have been posted on the Q and A of Zoom or on chat over to the um, uh, over to the Slack channel for continued discussion. So thank you. <laughs> to everybody who asked all those great questions and sorry we couldn't we couldn't get to all of them. Can I just add can I just add that you know I've heard the talk before so it's the questions that makes it interesting <laughs> to me. So thank you for the questions because it really brings new understanding and new light to it. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um let me see. I want to just put up one one last slide um and uh here we go. Screen this and do this. I just want to talk about what's coming up on the networking channel. And again, uh, a request to everybody, if you have ideas of things that you think would be really interesting, please contact the, the, uh, the program committee. There's about two dozen folks who are contributing ideas about what might be good future uh, activities to program here. And not just always talks like, you know, I want a tour of the data center, uh, for example, and, and really see what the inside uh, looks like. So we're really open to ideas. If you look at the networking channel.eu, uh, you'll find names and email addresses of folks to uh, email if you've got suggestions about future topics. So the next topic that's going to come up, uh, the next edition of the networking channel will be on the 7th of April. I want to remind everybody that in the Northern Hemisphere, I think more countries will be on uh, daylight savings time. We're sort of mixed right now between different countries. Um, everything starts at five o'clock p.m. Uh, Central uh, European time. So the next event is going to be a journey with millimeter wave research. You can see the speakers here, We've got tremendous speakers lined up for this. Uh, Jörg Widmer uh, from Indea Network, Sundin Rangan from NYU, and Michelle Zorzi from uh, the University of Padova. So we're, um, Oh, sorry, and also uh, Jin Yu Zhang from uh, UC San Diego. And the organizers of that are Antonio de, uh, de la Olivia and Man, uh, Manu Gosain from uh, Northeastern and NSF Power. So we're, the next talk will be great. Nick uh, and students and everyone, I think this was an absolutely fabulous way to, uh, to launch the networking channel. So thank you again for really 
uh, a really stimulating hour of discussion. And thank you for everybody for tuning in. See you in two weeks. Wonderful. Bye-bye now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks.